Good morning, Williams Creek Baptist Church family. It was Winston Churchill um, back in 1948 as he, he was quoting from another gentleman by the name of George Satanyaya, Satanyaya, uh, in 1905 when he, he declared those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. We find with regards to um, Churchill's speech before the House of Commons, uh, he changed the, the, the quote slightly when he, he paraphrased, those who fail to learn from history are condemned to repeat it. And we find that in terms of the, the times of, of both of these men, in terms of their history, they were facing great challenges uh, with regards to that. And we find ourselves in such a day as well. Um, we think about uh, our history as a nation and, you know, the history of nations and what was, what we have seen in terms of world history. Uh, that history is inclusive of redemptive history. We find here in our psalm this morning that the, the psalmist, uh, his name is Asaph, uh, he is calling God's people, Israel, to remember their history. He's actually instructing them in terms of uh, that history in this psalm, Psalm 78. And Psalm 78, is, psalm 78 is titled, A Contemplation of Asaph. And he's contemplating, he's remembering, he's bringing to mind uh, the history of God's people. And I, I want you to know whether it's, it's the history of God's people or it's the history of our nation or other nations or world history as we understand it and know it. Uh, we know that there are, uh, there is a fondness to some of that history, but we also know that there are difficulties. There are things in our history that if we had to do it over again, we would. But those lessons still remain in terms of history. We, we can't stamp out any type of history. It's still there. It, it is still part of, of our past. And what Asaph is doing as we gather around this psalm here this morning, and we're just going to focus in on the first eight ver verses of this psalm, but what Asaph is doing is he is calling Israel, God's people, to remember. He's instructing them with regards to the history uh, of God with his people, and part of that history is pretty ugly. And we see God's judgment unfold as a result of that. And so what Asaph is wanting his people to do, and what, what we can take from this text this morning, is not only that we remember history, but that we learn from it. And then that we take that learning, those lessons about who God is. This is what Asaph is setting before them. The, the, certainly the, 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 the signs and wonders, the strength and the praises of God, he wants us to remember, but he also wants us, us to remember, and he goes into some, some dark um, parts of their history as he opens up this psalm, as he walks through this psalm, um, and, and we are to remember those and, and learn the lessons from those um, historic realities, and then pass them on to the next generation. In this psalm, Asaph is instructing God's people concerning the Lord and His mighty acts in their history as a people. R.C. Sproul writes that as we witness in this psalm, this instruction is mainly by way of negative example. I mean, the predo predominance of, of what Asaph is referring to is some of the negative realities of the unfaithfulness of Israel Sproul goes on to say that he reminds his readers of the perverse ingratitude of the wilderness generation in particular, and that is the balance of uh, verses 9 through 53, but also the failure of Israel to set aside the idols of Canaan after the conquest, and we see that in verses 54 through 66. Most specifically in regard to Psalm 78, Asaph recites the history of God's covenant people so that the coming generations might know the statutes of the Lord's holy law and thereby hope in Him. 
As believers, we firmly confess the sovereignty of God and the surety of His promises. Simply put, He cannot fail to preserve His people. Even when we fail as God's people, He cannot fail to preserve His people for Himself. Nevertheless, we do not deny the role of responsible human agents in this preservation. We see it over and over in terms of the Scriptures. Though the efforts of faithful, for instance, church officers, or through the efforts of faithful church officers such as pastors and teachers, uh, apostles and prophets and evangelists, mothers and fathers, mentors of the faith, the Lord hands on His truth from generation to generation. So He passes on. That is the call. That's what we find in terms of the Word. That's, that's why God has given us His Word, so that, that we can not only learn the lessons, that we can learn the law and the teachings of the Lord and walk by them, but that we will pass that on to the next generation. That's what Asaph is doing here. And that's what he is calling us here this morning to. So this morning we are going to give our attention to Asaph's instruction that he has given in his first eight verses. Now I'm going to highlight some of the rest, remaining balance of the psalm, but we want to focus in on these first eight verses. And from the very first statement, Asaph calls God's people to listen, to listen to his instruction, to incline your ears to the word he is declaring. And his intention is twofold. That God's people heed, heed, that is, that they learn from and they uh, put into practice the lessons of God's uh, established testimony and instruction that is found in His Word, and then secondly, that we should pass them on, that we should teach them to the next generation. So let us read this portion of Psalm 78 together as we begin verses 1 through 8. Listen, O my people, to my instruction. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not conceal them from their children, but tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wondrous works that He has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should teach them to their children. That generation to come might know, that the generation to come might know, even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children, that they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God. But keep His commandments, and not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank You for the gift of Your Word. And in the context of the instruction of Asaph, may we listen to His instruction. May we incline our ears, give our devoted attention to this Word, Lord, that is Your Word, that we might learn these lessons from the past, and that, Lord, we might honor You in fidelity, that we might walk by faith, faithful, enduring to the end, persevering by Your grace and Your strength and the wisdom of Your Word. God, you guide us even in our day so that as we learn, as we grow in these words, as we grow in the wisdom and the stature of uh, maturity that belongs to Christ, as we see there in Ephesians 4, may we grow in that faithfulness so that we might pass these truths, these life-saving, transformational truths on to the next generation, and that we would see those who come after us coming after you. It's in the name of Jesus Christ I do pray, and amen. I want you to know that at the very outset, when, when Asaph is, is declaring there in verse 1, listen, O my people, to my instruction, we, we notice that 
in terms of, of those pronouns, um, he, he's referring to his, his instruction, but I want you to know that Asaph is a prophet. As we note uh, from um, his other writings and, and how he is described, Asaph was a prophet in his musical compositions, and he was a godly man who was passionately devoted to the Word of God. And so he is calling the people of Israel, and thereby as, as we walk through the ages, as we're receiving these words this morning, he is calling us as the people of God to be faithful, to give our attention, to hear this instruction. And so that's, as, as we see the, the breakdown of this text, that, that is the primary main focus that Asaph is wanting to accomplish here. That is his call to learn and to teach the next generation. So we, we are to learn from this instruction and to teach the next generation. And then in that context, what are we supposed to teach? Well, three things he, he reveals as he walks through uh, these eight verses. We find that well, we need to teach the preeminence of the Lord. He is primary. He is central, not only in terms of world history, in terms of redemptive history, but he is central to who we are as a people. We belong to him. If you're a believer this morning, uh, you certainly understand and recognize uh, that he is the son by which we revolve around in terms uh, of who we are uh, as the people of God. He is the centerpiece. He is everything. He is to be exalted. His praises are to be passed on to the next generation. And that's, that's what we find here, that as we learn and as we prepare, prepare to teach the next generation. We need to teach them the preeminence of the Lord. And a second teaching that we must pass on to them is to teach them the instruction of the Lord. And it, it is defined here by Asaph um, as, a, as a testimony and a law. And we'll look into that. And we have been looking at in, in terms of how God's Word is defined and how important it is for us to know it and to walk in it. But then finally, we need to teach them to be faithful to the Lord. And he gives us example, uh, one uh, prominent example, um, as, as we look at this text, uh, that we are not to follow. We are not to exemplify our life according to the way of their lives because they are marked as those who were unfaithful. And so, a call to learn and to teach the next generation, teaching them the preeminence of the Lord, teaching them the instruction of the Lord, and teaching them to be faithful to the Lord. And let's begin there with the call to learn and to teach. We must learn, Asaph says, from the lessons of history. And in this particular context, it's the lessons of the history of Israel, and they are vital to us as well as Christ's church. It is, it is part of um, the context of the very Word of God from Genesis to Revelation. And in the Old Testament history, that Old Testament history is there for us to learn from, to learn lessons from. And so we are to learn the lessons of history. And he he tells us this in, in terms of as he's preparing them, he's, he's calling them. He's, he's like getting their attention and saying, listen, listen, incline your ear. And he's telling them, uh, 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 listen, O people, to my instruction. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. Charles Spurgeon notes here that when God gives his truth a tongue, and sends forth his messengers trained to declare his word with power. It is the least we can do to give them our ears and the earnest obedience of our hearts. Shall God speak and his children refuse to hear? His teaching has the force of law. Let us yield both ear and heart to it. Now, I can certainly understand that those without faith, those without Christ in, in our day, 
that they they would not give their attention to. They would not incline their ear. They would not be interested in listening, as it were. But God is speaking to His people. And as His people, any time that we gather together, such as we are gathering here this morning, under the counsel of His Word, we must and we should give our undivided attention to this instruction. Listen to the word of the Lord. Receive the word of the Lord. Devote your attention and your heart to the teaching of this word. I've often said over the years that sometimes our listening and our inclining our ear to the teaching is, is coming uh, in preparation. As, as we have noted that the, in the Psalms that, that the people of God, they would come, um, they, they would come, before the Lord, they would be prepared en route. They would be praising God en route to uh, the gathering of His people to hear the counsel of the Word, the, the counsel of the Lord. And this is a principle that continues on. It, it continues on uh, all the way through to the book of, of Revelation when Jesus, in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation, is writing, He is writing specifically to seven churches. He is, he is providing insight. He is, he is characterizing them and he is calling them in terms of that characterization, uh, to move towards him in a particular direction in terms of fidelity. And each time we see it seven, seven different times in the first part of verse seven, in the first part of verse 11, in the first part of verse 17, in verse 29, uh, in the uh, first part or, or in, in chapter three, verse six, um, verse 13 and verse 22. We see the same thing over and over again as Jesus, uh, he, he gives, um, his declaration, um, his, um, as it were, uh, in, in, in six of those seven churches, he gives his judgment and he calls uh, for correction, to, uh, for repentance, to turn back. Um, each time he, he gives uh, those challenges once uh, at a time to each church, uh, like in verse 7. He says there uh, in Revelation chapter 2, the very first half, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Does the Holy Spirit have your ear here this morning? Does the Lord, the Holy God and Creator of not only the heavens and the universe, but the, 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 the Creator of uh, who we are, the new creation in Christ, uh, does the Lord have your attention here this morning? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so Asaph goes on to say in verse 2, he says, I will open my mouth in a parable. And, and a parable is a story. It is a story that brings about uh, an application. And in this particular uh, case, um, it, it is, uh, there, there is some uh, historical realities that he is unfolding in terms of this story, in terms of these parables. He says, I will open my mouth in parable and I will utter dark sayings of old. Now, what are these dark sayings of old? These are called dark sayings, not because they are hard to understand, but because they are things hidden since the foundation of the world. Now, he notes that with regards to, to these dark sayings, and these, these are hidden, hid, hidden truths that God is, has uh, hidden in terms of his prophetic word since the foundation. It goes back from the foundation of the world. In other words, uh, this is the truths that, that God uh, had intended and planned to reveal and then revealed as uh, his word began to unfold, and yet they would come to fruition at a certain time in terms of redemptive history. And the greatest example of this, and at the heartbeat, and it is the centerpiece of the Scriptures in terms of redemptive history, is the coming of God's Messiah, the Christ. And of course, as we have come to know and understand through um, the 
revelations that we find of the coming Messiah in the Old Testament that Jesus is this Messiah. He is uh, the one who has come, that God has sent as his Messiah, as his Savior, for all those who believe in him. And so, for instance, uh, we find there in Matthew chapter 13, uh, this example, and he is quoting, uh, Matthew is quoting uh, from uh, Psalm 78, verse 2 here, in the second, in verse 35. But he says, all these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables, and he did not speak to them without a parable. And we, we, we can go through the Gospels and find parable after parable after parable of the teachings. And again, you know, what's in those parable are hidden truths. And those who have the ear to hear and understand by the Spirit will understand these truths. And so when, when he writes, when Matthew writes, all these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables, uh, and he did not speak to them without a parable, then he goes on to say in verse 35, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. And this particular prophet is Asaph. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. And John MacArthur clarifies here that, that what Asaph proph prophesied here, and that, that is being revealed in the coming of Christ and in his teaching, his public ministry, and the parables that he was sharing, is Asaph is prophesying that the Messiah... He would have to speak in parables. That he would have to speak in parables as an act of judgment. And that to his own people, he would reveal a secret kept from the foundation of the world. And what is that secret? What ultimately, as we look at what Asaph is calling us uh, to recollect, to remember, to learn from the lessons of history with regards to what's unfolding in terms of Old Testament history and his people Israel. What is the greatest secret that he is saying is unfolding with regards to these hidden things? These hidden things, this mystery that has existed since the foundation of the world, so from, from the beginning of, of the history of the world, be, and it was always with God, that, that mystery was always there, that, that hidden uh, truth that was to be revealed. This mystery, which is spoken of in Psalm 78, which is quoted here in Matthew 13, verse 35, is the mystery of how God, in the history of Israel, reveals himself and works out his plans. And that's the mystery which Asaph speaks of in parables. In figurative sayings, in dark things, this mystery which had been hidden from old, now God reveals himself and works out his plan in, hist in the history of Israel. And this is ultimately fulfilled, and this mystery is revealed through the coming of his promised Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God. And we see that. We, we are going to pick up on that at the end of our time together this morning. Uh, at the latter part of Psalm 78, we see that unfolding. That mystery is, is um, marked there, that's hidden right there in those final words that reveals to us uh, the coming of the Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God. And so he is, he is telling uh, his people, at his time in world history, he is telling them in terms of the history of the people of Israel, he says, which we have heard and known. In other words, we have heard these truths before. We have heard them, and our fathers have told us about them, and the Lord is revealing them. And so Asaph is offering a summary and recounting. And as, as we look in terms of this recounting, in terms of, of their history, and we have seen this. We have seen this as we have been walking through these Psalms this, these last 16 weeks together, that the Lord himself um, is all-powerful and that he has his purpose and, and that he is going to bring his purpose to fruition and, 
And he uses his great power and authority to bring that about. And we have seen his signs and wonders, the signs that, that are revealed in creation and the signs and wonders that are revealed in how he has um, uh, preserved and saved his people Israel and raised them up and, and you know, just the whole journey and how he provided for them, for instance, in the wilderness, how he uh, enabled them and emancipated them from the slavery of, of Egypt. And he brought them through the Red Sea, which is a miraculous wonder. They walked across on dry land, and the Lord provided food and water for them in the wilderness experience. We just see it over and over again. We have have been rehearsing these historical realities of the powers and the wonders and the sovereignty of God. And yet, in this history, we find that there are some very dark days in the lives of the people of Israel. And Asaph is, he is reminding, he is instructing his people with regards to uh, these uh, experiences of infidelity. And that infidelity was marked by idolatry, that God's own people were worshiping and following after the gods, the pagan gods of the world and the nations surrounding them. And so Asaph, for by example, he is providing a warning through the historic examples that he is presenting here. And, and most notably, it is the example of the tribe of Ephraim in this psalm. Now, uh, J. Lincoln Duncan, he writes uh, and gives a, a brief summary. This is one of the ways that we're going to tap in uh, to some of the balance of the psalm because it's a very long psalm. So I'm just going to highlight this summary using Um, this summary that J. Ligon Duncan has um, so graciously written to help us understand this. He says, as you you look at verses 9 and 10, this begins the description of Ephraim. And by the way, Ephraim is picked out not because of anything that it that is recorded in the Bible that, that they did particularly bad in battle, but because they are representatives of the most influential of the tribes of the northern kingdom. And so they serve as a picture of the whole northern kingdom that eventually went after idolatry after the days of King Jeroboam. But we're told this about them at the end of verses 9 and 10 and 11. It says, they turned back in the day of battle. They did not keep the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law. They forgot his deeds and his miracles that he had shown them. But that's not all. We see in verses 17, 18, and 19, we are told that they still continue to sin against God, to, to sin against him, to rebel against the Most High in the desert. And in their heart, they put God to the test. Verse 19, they spoke against God. And then verse 22, they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation. So again, we have a recounting of of their ingratitude and their blatant disobedience, but it doesn't stop there. Verse 32, in spite of all of this, they still sinned and did not believe in him with their tongue, for their heart was not steadfast toward him, nor were they faithful in his covenant. Then in verse 40, how often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Again and again they tempted God and pained the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power. And finally, we see in verse 56, that they tempted and rebelled against the Most High God and did not keep His testimonies, but turned back and acted treacherously like their father. They turned aside like a treacherous bow. They provoked Him with their high places and aroused His jealousy with their graven images. In other words, Ephraim just fell into wretched idolatry. They rejected the Most High God. They they rejected the only God that exists and created for themselves gods of their own creations or or, um, they took the gods of the pagan nations and began to make their graven images and worship them. 
See, these are the treacherous lessons of history. And they are written so that we may not repeat them. As we see from our introduction with regards to Churchill, never forget. Do not forget. Remember your history or we are destined to repeat it. We have seen that in the lives of God's people here unfold. And it's what Asaph is, he's warning them. He, he is teaching them. He is reminding them. And in terms of reminding and bringing that to their attention, uh, we see and recognize the importance of, of bringing that back to our attention. I, I think, um, for instance, and again, this is, is not in my notes, but it's in my mind right now. As the Spirit just continues to lead in, in the teaching of His Word, um, and I believe it is found in Second Peter, um, chapter one. Um, I'm going to begin in verse ten, and he is he is talking about their fidelity. He's talking about the fidelity of those who belong to Christ. And that we should pursue that in a variety of different ways. And then he begins to say in verse 10, uh, and we'll go through verse 12. Um, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. And again, the things that he's calling us to practice are things in terms of faithfulness. It's the knowledge and wisdom of God kindness and the attributes of Christian character that belong uh, to our Lord, that we uh, exemplify Christ. Verse 11, for in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. And then Peter goes on to say in verse 12, and this is, this is a, one of those verses very, very similar to Asaph in terms of his calling to remember He's teaching and instructing them things that they've already heard from their fathers before that they've learned and known about before, but he is bringing it up again. And so we see there in verse 12, Peter goes on to say to the church, therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth, which is present with you. He goes on to say in verse 13, I want to continue there. I consider it right as long as I am with you. I can, or I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder. And you know, the, one of the, the ways that we can characterize God's call upon his people, Israel, throughout the Old Testament scriptures, he just kept calling them to remember, to remember, to remember to remember. And we see that in the New Testament. Peter, in terms of teaching uh, truths that, that uh, the church was already versed in, that they already knew, he continues, he says, I'm going to continually remind you of those truths. Why? Why does he want to remind us? Why is Asaph wanting to remind us? Because there are God's instruction for our life, that we might walk in his ways and that we may not repeat the infidelity of those who've gone before us, that we might walk in faithfulness, and that we might also, secondly, teach the lessons of history to the next generation. We are to learn, and then we are to teach the lessons of history, these lessons. And Asaph goes on to say, we will not conceal them, that is, these lessons, we will not conceal the instruction and the testimony of the Lord. We will not conceal them from their children, but tell to the generation to come. It's like, well, pastor, that sounds like some good truth, but that's, that's Old Testament truth. That's God's people, Israel, and now we are a New Testament church. What do these truths have uh, to do with our lives as we continue to walk in the Lord. And Paul, he speaks to this. We find in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 6. Now, these things happened as examples for us. What things? The things of old. 
the Old Testament scriptures and the, the history that is written there, these things happen as examples for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And upon whom, who, who has the end of the ages come? Us. We are living in the last days, brothers and sisters. And the Lord is giving us the warning of the instruction of the Old Testament Scriptures to bear upon our own lives as examples of how not to walk, but that we might walk in faithfulness with Him and then he gives us a personal challenge there in verse 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. In other words, we need to measure up our, our walk, our life, our faith by the means of God's instruction and the examples that he has given us and that we should be walking according to them. And so, we are to learn the lessons, the instruction, these historical lessons, even you know, the, the great and wonderful things about God and, and His provision and His power and His wonders and His creation and all those kinds of things. But also, uh, we must re remember the example of those who were unfaithful. They are a warning to us. Even as Paul uh, represents here in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, they serve as example for us um, that we would not follow in their ways. That we would walk with the Lord in faithfulness. Well, three key things that the Lord is revealing here through Asaph that we should teach on the basis of the instruction of God and the basic elements that He wants us to pass on to the next generation is first and foremost, teach them the preeminence of the Lord. He is primary. He is central, the heartbeat of our faith. He is who we serve and worship. He is the one who has redeemed us. He is the one who has chosen us as a people for His own possession. He is the one who has purchased us through the blood of His Son. All of history is the history of God's redemption of His people. And this stage of history is unfolding uh, as, as we would see Jonathan Edwards describe it as that, uh, that the stage of world history is the stage upon which God is unfolding redemptive of history and therefore we need to by example and by teaching from the instruction of the word of the Lord we need to tell the next generation the praises of the Lord and there are so many ways that we can praise the Lord so many truths in the scripture that reveal the praise and the thanksgiving and the worship and one of the ways that we are declaring that into, in this generation today is when we gather together in our worship to praise and lift up the name of the, law, the Lord. We, we encourage and exhort one another with hymns and psalms and spiritual songs. We give thanksgiving to the Lord. We gather here to worship the Lord as a collective body because the He deserves our praise. He is worthy of our praise. And so when we come, it's, it, we're not coming just simply to say, well, what's in it for me? No, we come to worship and lift up and declare the glory of the one who has purchased us with the blood of His Son and who has saved us. We need to tell them the praises of the Lord, and we need to tell them of the strength of the Lord there in verse 4. And that strength 
That strength is, is unfolded. We see it uh, from the very beginning of the books of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We see creation unfold by the, the power of God simply to speak, and it comes into existence. We see it in the, in the, the life of Christ, who is, is the God who became flesh, who was with God in the beginning and was God, or is God. He is God. And He became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen the glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full, full of grace and truth, uh, John 1 and John 1, 14. When His disciples witnessed Him in a boat in a tumultuous storm, and He was, he was asleep in the bottom of the boat, and they were crying out because they, they believed that they were going to die. And he awakes, he, he awakes up, and he stands in the boat, and he just says, peace, be still. And the wind and the waves ceased, and it was calm. And his disciples, they, they asked, who is this? Who is he that even the wind and the waves obey his commands? He is the all-powerful God, the Son of God, God the Son. Tell them the strength of the Lord and tell them the wondrous works of the Lord. And they're just over and over and over again. But the, the greatest and wondrous work of the Lord that we can pass on to the next generation is redemption, is salvation. That Jesus has wrought. He has, uh, by His death on the cross, he has secured our redemption for eternity. This is the greatest, most wondrous work of God that for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And here's the good news. Whosoever would believe in Him, if you would believe in Him, if you would confess Jesus as your Savior, repent of your sin, He gives us eternal life. We will not perish, but have everlasting life. Teach them the preeminence of the Lord. Teach them, secondly, the instruction of the Lord. And this instruction of the Lord, we, we've looked at that in Psalm 19. We've seen it described in, in Psalm 119. We've seen it in a variety of different psalms that we've been walking through throughout this season. Uh, so many ways that the word of the Lord is described. Well, here he describes his word in this way. God, he, for he, God, the Lord, Yahweh, he established a testimony in Jacob. And he has appointed a law. And again, the law, um, that, that, that word law, sometimes when we think of law, we think in terms of our court system, our legal uh, structures in terms of our governance and these kinds of things, and there's laws on the books and these kinds of things, uh, laws that we have to obey, speed laws, you know, you know, road and sign laws and those kinds of things, but other types of criminal types of codes and all this kind of stuff. But the Hebrew, Hebrew word here for law is Torah. And the Torah, in terms of the Old Testament scriptures, is the compilation of the teachings and instructions of God. And in, in that, in, in that teaching and the instructions of the Lord and the Torah is, is, you know, all the, the, the words in, in terms of prophecy, but also in terms of the law that God has set, the, the Ten Commandments, the Levitical and sacrificial laws, all those kinds of things, the history, all of that is, is placed there. That is, is what he is, is saying, that he established it, that he um, established a testimony. This is his testimony. This is his testimony about himself, and he has established it in Jacob. And he has appointed a law in Israel. In other words, his teachings and his instructions. I mean, you can go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, and you can see what is known as the Shema. The Shema was um, the, the teachings. It was, you know, the, the call to fidelity to the commandments of the Lord and to pass them on. Every household must pass them on to the next generation. We see that unfold 
in the life of Israel. When we come uh, to the second generation entering the promised land, when Joshua is about ready to take them into the land of promise, you know, as before they take on the battles and, and you know, the Lord uh, was uh, mighty in battle and, and, you know, raised up Joshua as, a, as the, the leader uh, and the general to, to lead them into battle. And yet the battle belonged to the Lord. And he told Joshua the heart of, of his military strategy was to keep the commands of God. Do not turn from them one way or the, the other. He just kept saying over and over, keep these commands, walk in these commands. Walk in the established testimony and the law in Israel. That's why the Bible is the the preeminent book in terms of world history. There's no other book like it because it it is the book that belongs. It is the testimony and the law the instruction of the the God, the the, the one and only creator God uh, of the heavens and the earth. And he established that testimony and he commands, he has commanded his teaching. um, And as we see that in terms of verse 5, that he not only appointed uh, this law in Israel, this established testimony in Jacob, he commanded our fathers that they should teach them to their children. That's where we see in Deuteronomy 6, the Shema. You, You may spend some time there and just look at that today. Look at what the Lord commanded the, the fathers and the households and the household of God to teach them to their children, to pass it on to the next generation, to raise up a generation who fears the Lord. And so they command the next, the command to teach the next generation the word of the Lord, the teaching of the, of the, of the Lord. And you know what? Paul is preparing Timothy. And we find in terms of the New Testament church as it's advancing, Paul's coming in near the end of his life. And in the second epistle that he is sending him, uh, he's, he's rotting from prison in preparation uh, for the end of his life. And he is saying to Timothy in, in, in chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, he says to Timothy, Timothy, retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. In other words, retain, hold on to them, keep them, remember them. What? The the standard of sound words. What is it that Paul passed on to Timothy? The word of the Lord. Or he goes on to say in verse 14 of 2 Timothy 1, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, the treasure which has been entrusted to you. What is this treasure? The faith. The faith is found in the substance. The substance of our faith is the word of the Lord. Guard that treasure by means of the Holy Spirit that dwells within you because the Holy Spirit will not turn from the very word of God. He has uh, arrived. He has come uh, as the promise of, of God the Father through Jesus. He has come and dwells His people. And what does He do? He validates. He brings to light the very Scriptures and the teachings that we find in the Word of the Lord, the Bible. So new revelation Don't believe that in this world. Many false teachers are talking about new revelations or they have a new and fresh word. No, we have the word of the Lord, the testimony and the law, both in the Old Testament and New Testament that God has given us in the Holy Spirit. He has come to convict the world using using that word. And He has come to reveal those truths so that we might understand them and know them. Hey, you want to listen and incline your ear? Just pray. Pray that the Holy Spirit would bring these matters to light and to revelation in your heart and your mind. So, why are we going to pass on these truths to the next generation? Why does Asaph command this instruction to be passed on to the next generation? Well, verse 6 
so that the generation to come might know. That they might, ex- that the generation might come to know God's word and knowing God's word, they come to know God. That they would know and keep God's word. That, that the generation to come might know even the children yet to be born. That we are committed to the, the pres- preservation of this word throughout the generations. And we certainly do that by the means of God's grace and His Spirit in our lives. That this generation might come to know, might come, that the generation to come might know, even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children. So I have children, and now I have grandchildren. And it's my prayer that not only Will my children continue to walk in in faithfulness and fidelity to the word of the Lord, but that my grandchildren would be raised in the fear and admonition of the Lord, and that they would too walk in fidelity with the Lord, and that they would raise up the next generation and tell the next generation these truths, that they should put their confidence, verse 7, in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. That is a measure of faithfulness and fidelity that we see unfolding here. So what does it mean to put your confidence in God? It means not to forget the works of God. It means to keep the commandments of God. And again, you know, we see that uh, in the Shema, in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And, and let me just read a portion of that um, from the very outset. Um, in verse 1 of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now, this is the commandment, the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, Moses is saying, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it, so that you and your sons and your grandson might fear the Lord your God. You know, generation after generation after generation would know and fear the Lord God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I commanded you all the days of your life and that your days may be prolonged. Oh, Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it. Not just hear it, but do it, that it may be well with you and that you may multiply greatly just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. And there it is. The heartbeat of the Shema, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I command, I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them uh, when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. In other words, talk about it all the time. It should always be on Uh, the heartbeat of your conversations and your witness and your testimony and the way that you're walking. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and, and on your gates. And thereby, as we as we are teaching the next generation the praises of the Lord, the preeminence, that He is preeminent, And as we are teaching the instruction of the Lord, the very word, the the, the testimony and the instruction, the law of God, thereby we can teach them to be faithful to the Lord. Now, I'm telling you, if if people are going to be faithful to the Lord, it's going to require divine intervention. But we can exemplify and teach this. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So, brothers and sisters, let us be faithful to teach this word and to pass it on to the next generation. How does Asaph suggest that we teach faithfulness to the Lord? Well, by example. And the very first thing he says in verse 8 is, Do not be like your fathers. They were stubborn and re- a, a stubborn and rebellious generation. They were a generation that did not prepare its heart. They were a generation whose spirit was not faithful to God. So he is giving us this history, and, and, and some of that history is is wretched and is filled with the infidelity of God's people who fell into idolatry. 
And so the examples of unfaithful, unfaithful, and un, of unfaithfulness in the past underscored the importance of faithfulness in men like Asaph in his day, in his calling by extension, the importance of faithfulness uh, in those who were hearing him and his word. And here we are. Here we are, brothers and sisters, hearing that word today that we see the significance, the importance of our own faithfulness in this generation, in this time. Yet the significance of this psalm is not exhausted in a call for us to be faithful based on the negative examples of the ancient covenant community. So instead, Asaph's final words of this psalm with its rehearsal of the anointed, an anointing of David, David who would become king. David, when, when David comes on the scene, he rules, he rules and reigns by the, the testimony and the law, the Torah of God, and there is no idolatry in his day. And yet, David would even stumble in adultery. So Asaph's final word of this psalm, even though it speaks to the anointing of David, points forward to the greater of all examples, the greatest of all examples, who is David's greater son, who is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Asaph reveals there in verse 66, just a quick review of what God has done in terms of the history of his people and how that affects who we are in our day. That God, in verse 66, he drove his adversaries backward. He put on them uh, an everlasting reproach. And that most notably, uh, you know, the adulterous nations, the idolatrous nations. He destroyed, like the Philistines under David. David brought, um, you know, a close to um, the, the enemy that the Philistines were, uh, with, with us, you know, a, a few stones when he fell, the mighty Goliath. And yet, ungodly nations would continue to rise on and ungodly influence would continue to affect his people, Israel. But God, he drove out his adversaries and the Lord rejected. And we see there in verse, um, uh, 67, he rejected the tent of Joseph and he did not choose the, the tribe of Ephraim. And we would think Joseph, if, if anybody was faithful to God, Joseph was. He even said to his brothers who had sold him into slavery, he said, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. So, or Genesis 45, 7, uh, you know, he was faithful. He came through treacherous times and believed God for the, the word, the, the word that God had given him. And it came to pass. He went on to say to his brothers at the end of, of uh, near the end of, of Genesis 50, uh, verse 20, after his father Jacob Um, Israel had passed on. As for you, he says to his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. And yet, the preservation of God's people would not come specifically through the man known as Joseph. He was an instrument for his day. But Ephraim, who would come out of um, the tribe, uh, the people, he was a son of Joseph. Ephraim, as we see in S- Psalm 78, um, the tribe of Ephraim fell into adult idolatry, and they were rejected due to their unfaithfulness. I did not, I, I, he also rejected the tent of Joseph, and, and who was in that tent? Ephraim. And Ephraim, the tribe, became idolatrous. And so the Lord, we see there in verse 68, and here we see the promises, the messianic promises. But, but he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved. And that, that fulfills the prophecy you know, we, we see in, in Genesis 49, 10, that the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler, ruler staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. And who does Shiloh represent? 
And it represents the kingdom of David, the throne of David. And he built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth, which he has founded forever. In other words, in terms of Mount Zion, uh, where Judah was, you know, the, the centerpiece, Mount Zion became the central worship center of Yahweh. And then we find there in verses 70 through 72 that God, Yahweh, chose David as his servant to shepherd Jacob, his people. He also chose David, verse 70, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds, from the care of the ewes with suckling lambs. He brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them with his skillful hands, and he did so by the word of the Lord. But as good as David was, he was not the king to secure the faithfulness of God's people. R.C. Sproul writes that a new David will rise, a king to rule in perfect righteousness like David, who was a shepherd of humble origin. This king will come from inauspicious beginnings to lead God's people with upright heart and skillful hand. Like David, this new humble king will rely not on others to usher in the kingdom, but on God alone. We know this king to be Jesus Christ. And we see it. We see it in the testimony of the Lord in the birth account given to Mary, the mother, the earthly mother of Jesus in Luke 1, 31 to 33. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call, you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end and this Jesus is the one who saves us this Jesus is the one who redeems the people for God's possession we belong to him he has purchased us by his blood and he is the example of perfect fidelity and perfect righteousness that's why the teachers that God has given the church today as he says in Ephesians 4 11 and following and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Until what? Until we attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man. To the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. That we become alike him more and more as we walk in faithfulness to his word and grow in his word. So that's why Paul said to Timothy, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. And he would go on to say to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will, will be able to teach others also. In other words, to pass it on, to keep passing it on to the next generation. Brothers and sisters, God is calling us today to continue learning continue to grow in his testimony and his instruction, which is the word, his word, the word of God. And we need to teach the next generation. Well, what should we be teaching the next generation? We should be teaching them the preeminence of the Lord, his praises, his mighty deeds, his wondrous works. We should be teaching them the instruction of the Lord, his testimony. It's established. It is steadfast. It is eternal. It remains forever. We should teach them the instruction of the Lord because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. And then finally, teaching them to be faithful to the Lord. And that is, we must point them to, to Christ. We must share the gospel with the next generation so that they might come to faith. And then by the means of God's grace and His Spirit and His Word, that we can continue together walking in fidelity and faithfulness. Sproul, he notes as we conclude that our great 
God ushered in his kingdom, not with a show of force, but through the humble Jesus, the Lamb of God who laid down his life to save his people from their sins. Do you believe this? Would you receive Christ Jesus today as your Lord and Savior? It's our prayer that you would, that you would hear these words and you would put your faith and trust in him. Repent of your sin and turn to Christ. He died for your sins so that you might be saved. This Jesus is the only leader who can guide us in perfect righteousness, and it is in him alone that we have a sure hope. May we bow to his sovereign reign today, seeking to follow him according to his great word, and may we pass these truths, life-saving gospel truths, God's word to the next generation. And as Jude would say in Jude 1, verse 3, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Let us continue to contend for the faith that we have received through the Word of God, by the grace of God, by the means of His power and His Spirit. Let us continue to share it now and to the next generation. Lord, thank you for the gift of our time together here today. We pray, Father God, that you would be most glorified and magnified by these words, and that, Lord, we would see people come to believe and to trust and to rest in you. In this generation and the generations to come, Lord, you will fulfill your promises, and you will bring every last one of your people into the fold. The Lord, help us to be faithful to proclaim the gospel that is this word, your testimony and your instruction so that faith can come by hearing and hearing by the word, the word of Christ. It's in the name of Jesus Christ I pray. Amen.